a little more complex. So you open this thing up, and what does it want you to do? It wants you to open, enter the coefficients in the numerator and denominator of polynomials. So this says minus 0.1x plus 1. Those are the coefficients of the denominator. x cubed, x squared, s, s to the 0. That's all you have to do. And what's kind of nice is when you're done doing it, 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 sh it shows you what it looks like. You make sure you like the way it looks. Like the actual numbers, OK? And then what do we do here? Just open this thing, you know. Obviously, I took all the icons, I dropped them in, um, connected them up, and I called this thing Y1. And then, I ch as usual, I change this to an array because I can use the defaults to a structure, which we don't like. Okay. And then the new thing is how do you simulate something that looks like. Um, so, what did we establish this thing was here? I think I didn't worry about, I just took K to be 1. Because I think K doesn't have anything to do with what we're trying to show here. So I just took K to be 1. And this thing is minus 3.6. I think we established here 3.6s. So the question is, how do I simulate the response of that thing to a step change in, in Simulink? Well, the way Simulink works is you have to, if you have a time delay, you have to have the transfer function and then the time delay in series. There's not transfer functions with time delay, so you have to put them in there separately. Okay. So I put the transfer function in there in the normal way, right? And you know, you can come down here and change this name, you know, so it's otherwise it'll just say transfer function one and two and three. Um, and then the key thing is you have to put this trans uh, transfer function transport delay in there. Okay. What's typical in Simulink, it asks you for a lot of things that you don't know the answer to. Hopefully you know the answer to the first one. What's the value of the time delay? Okay, 3.6. Then it says, what's the initial output? It'll default to zero. That's the right answer. What, what's the buffer size? You'll be like, what buffer size? That just means how many values in it is it going to store? Because if you have a time delay, you have to store values from the past, right? And so this should be big enough. It's 1,000 values. If it's not, you'll get an error that says, I've exceeded your buffer size. But that would be pretty, pretty unusual. Okay. And there might be other things down here. Oh, so you can do a pot of it. How so fun. All right. So you get this, and then I write this all to the workspace. I take a time, um, simulates over 40 time units, because I know that's good. In principle, I run it, and it works. Yay. OK, then I can plot. So I think if you look, it's created these things over here in the workspace. So when you run a simulation, it's always smart to look up in your workspace and see if the things you think were created are there. Okay. Don't be surprised. No one likes surprises. So I think this is, you got to do it this way, I think. Okay. You know, and I could label it and all that. I give it a legend, but that's the same thing. So that's the, the blue one is the original transfer function, the red one is the scope extent, the green one is the tail extent. So it just looks like what you got in the book. Okay. So if you ever wonder how all those results are generated in books that are plots, you can safely conclude the authors of the book asked their grad students to generate these plots and then um, gave them no compensation for doing so. All right. Do you know the guy at Seaboard that wrote the book was my PhD advisor? Just FYI. And he never gave me anything. So. Um, all right. I, I probably deserve some royalties. All right, so that's the end of that. Okay, so now we're going to shift here. So what have we learned so far? This, this spiel, right? This is what we've, this pretty much all we've learned. We haven't learned anything else. This is new. So if I give you a set of differential equations, you can find a transfer function. If it's not linear, you have to linearize them. Um, once you have a transfer function, you can compute the response if you're willing to take the inverse Laplace transform. If you don't want to do that, or can't do that, you can at least find something about the response by looking at the poles and zeros and time delays and things like that. Okay? All right. So this is great. This sounds fantastic. But I think I mentioned this example to you. Let's say that you're um, in a plant and you want to build a simple, what is, we'll see, why are we building these models instead of just simulating the differential equations? Because we can take these Gs and design controllers directly from them. Okay? So the reason we're interested in developing all this machinery for control is that, well, for dynamics, is because you can see a lot about the behavior directly in this G function. Okay, you'll learn how to do that with poles and zeros. 
So the other thing is you can take this G, the process transfer function, and develop a controller directly from it. Okay. So let's say you're in a plant and you decide um, that you know you have a tower, also known as a distillation column, and you you think and you're trying to control the overhead composition and you don't like the overhead composition control. And hopefully you guys know how industry works. The way industry works is you get a job with Exxon Mobil, and then for two or three years you're at one place, then they send you to another place for two or three years, and they send you to another place for two or three. They move you around a lot. So you're never in one plant for very long, it seems. If you don't want to move, then they'll tell you you don't have professional aspirations. <laughs> okay. You might say something like, well, I have a family, but that won't mean a lot to them. Okay. So you go into a, you go into a plant. Um, you take over work that someone else has done for the last few years, typically. You might find, oh, I have this column that I'm responsible to control for, and when I try to control the overhead comp when I do, when I run the controllers that are already there, it doesn't work well. So, let's see, here's time, and here's the overhead composition, let's call it Y, and here's the set point. Okay. And, you know, maybe it's like, you know, wandering around too much, like you think it needs to be closer to the set point. And the controller is not well designed. So you say, okay, so I took Henson's class and got a B minus. Um, I took Henson's class and I decided that I should apply the principles in his class. So he told me the first thing I should do is find a process transfer function here. This process transfer function will relate the overhead composition to, let's say, the reflux. Okay? Because that's what the controller does. It changes the reflux and control the overhead composition. Okay, so I'm going to get this transfer function. And then you then you go back in your notes and you're like, wow, the distillation column doesn't look like a stirred tank either. Okay. And it doesn't look like any example I so what are you not going to do? What you're not going to do is write the material and energy balances for the column and then linearize them and find the transfer function. That's just not practical, right? Because number one, that's, that's a hard task in and of itself. That's why you guys use Aspen, for example, to do that in design. If you were capable of doing that, it would take you a long time. Your transfer function order would be like 200 order. Right? Because every, you have, uh, let's say, your propane, propylene splitter, it's 100 equilibrium stages. It's got five components. Actually, then it'll be like, you got component, you got component balances, energy balance, material balance, five, so 700 differential equations. 700 order transfer function. <laughs> and it took you two and a half years to get it. Okay. Um, so this is not good. So what they do in industry a lot, and for things that are complex like that, is they find data and then they, then they find the model. Okay. So what you've done is you found the model and then you can predict or simulate what happens to the process. Another approach, which is more commonly used if things are complex, is you collect data and then you figure out a model from the data directly. It's called empirical modeling. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is give you a little background to this. This is a very important problem in industry, and I'm pretty sure every one of you will encounter this if you're a process engineer or control engineer. Uh, so I'm going to give you some background on this. I'll talk about how to find the transfer functions that we have focused on, which is first order and second order and also integrating. And then I'll talk a little bit about this. We don't actually use this. I just want to mention there's a toolkit available in that lab that does all the stuff we talk about and much more. Okay. All right. So, okay, I've already done this, right? So fundamental models, we like these. They're derived from conservation principles. We use like for the problems we, we get differential equations in time. This is always the preferred approach when you can do it. Because why would you forego basic principles of chemical engineering unless you had to. Okay. The problem with this is that sometimes um, the model, like I said, might be way too complex and really hard to find. Sometimes the, the model might have, so you can write down the equations, but there's a lot of parameters associated with the model. Like if you were to do a reactor, you have to know like the fr frequency. Value.